A warm welcome to everybody who's joined us for today's fireside chat with Untouched World. We're going to be hearing from Perry Drysdale, who is an industry OG, truly one of the originals, um, been in the business for over 40 years. So one of the very first businesses to take on board great fashion production alongside sustainability as part of the core mission. So Perry, warm welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, Thank you. Let's start by, I'd love to hear a little bit about where it all began for you. Well, it did begin right, uh, right here in New Zealand. And uh, I was looking for something to do after I had um, had to stop my career. Way back in those days, you couldn't, uh, there was no such thing as maternity leave in New Zealand. And the only things that I really knew at that time that I could think of when I did a stock take of my skills and experience was having grown up on a sheep farm, a large sheep farm, and I had two little children. So I decided to uh, make some, add some value to that wool that was being grown um, throughout New Zealand. And I got a neighbour to teach me how to knit and <laughs> I made a pattern up for some infant size, the one, two and three year old garments, uh, little hooded jackets and mittens and booties. And I uh, decided to take those, those to market. In fact, and, uh, the whole business was really um, started to, to export because I wanted to offer the, the natural wool with and wrap around the beautiful clean green values that that, uh, that that New Zealand had. Uh, but unfortunately, those items were way too small to be able to encourage our local spinner to uh, spin the yarn for me. So we very soon had to go into um, children's and then adults' uh, garments all within the first six months. So I started with 10 out workers and I had 500 within four years. It was just crazy. And uh, within a few years, we were exporting uh, through uh, North America, uh, three countries in Asia and Australia. So I was a busy person. <laughs> I, I put on the screen some of your very original products. Oh, yes. <laughs> and you can see how much they've changed over the years. Do you want to they... tell us a little bit about these ones we're seeing here? Well, these were all in, the, uh, and, and initially we started with undyed uh, wool, and so everything was natural. Uh, I think we, we had four colours ranging from, from natural white through to charcoal. I think my, my husband got really freaked out when we went into red and blue, <laughs> um, thought I was being really crazy. So, um, and this, this is just where the market was then, and those sort of uh, fair early um, type of garments, they sold incredibly well. And those little things off to the right of my screen, I'm not sure where they are with you, the little booties and mittens. Um, the boots had sheepskin soles in the bottom. And we just sell so many of them. They're such great little products. Yeah. And right from the very beginning, it was all about wool and local production and Sustainability seems to have been inherent. I mean, how did that how did that happen for you? Well, I think growing up on I, I grew up up the Rakai Gorge uh, in the South Island of New Zealand, just under the Alps, and it was just beautiful and pristine. You could you could drink out of the the creeks and the rivers, and everything. The sky was blue, and the grass was green, the snow was white, and I think I. It was just inbuilt in me to want to the whole planet to to uh, to to be environmentally positive, and so I think that was the beginning. But it wasn't until we started in 1981. It wasn't until about the mid 90s that we really started to talk about sustainability. That word sustainability wasn't being used at all in those early days. And it wasn't until I started traveling around the world hugely, realizing that the world was in a really bad way and that the 
and nobody was really kind of kind of thinking about it. They were just uh, talking about the um, GDP and how big a business was, but there was absolutely no conversation about what it was doing to the planet or how the people were being looked after. And I just worried and worried and worried about that. You know, when uh, you're traveling from New Zealand, when there was no internet, when you boarded a plane, there would be piles of newspapers at the plane door, and those newspapers would be from all the countries that you'd either been to or going to. So I used to sit on these long haul flights and read these newspapers, and I just realized that it just wasn't something that anybody was thinking about. And, and so what do you do? You know, you, you've got a, a small company down in the bottom of the world and you're a woman to boot. Um, how are you going to make any sort of change at all? Uh, so that's when we decided to um, build the Untouch World brand into a lifestyle brand. At that stage, it was an undyed, organic, uh, certified organic, um, chunky range of knitwear and uh, we yeah we <laughs> you got quite sorry. famous at one point <laughs> yeah we got yeah we got <laughs> quite well known at one stage and so so the whole point was that we decided that if we built a sustainable business uh, and could model sustainable business then if we made our product gorgeous enough then we could get influential people into the products and in turn, they could do the influencing for us. So that's kind of how we've gone about it. We've been really lucky, actually. We've had a lot of help from our prime ministers and governors general and, I say, people like um, President Obama, but a lot of people have been very, very supportive of what we've been trying to do. I think you're very modest as to what you've achieved. I think very few fashion brands have dressed Obama, um, but also being the first and perhaps the only fashion brand to be uh, recognized by the UN. Do you want to tell us a little bit how that happened and how you how you made that happen? You know, how was it that your, your, your drive has driven you to not just continue to integrate sustainability, but to get the products right and get them out there and visible and selling so that you can have more impact? Well, the UN thing was, uh, wasn't was anything that I particularly drove. It was just there was a, a meeting down in Cape Town in South Africa uh, about uh, sustainability, and someone talked about what we were doing. And we got a call from um, Paris, from, the, uh, from UNESCO there, to say, could you please send us information about what you're doing? And we did that, and then that very quickly was followed up by, could you please come and address a meeting that we're having in Bonn? I think there were 44 countries there. Um, and the topic was how to uh, engage the corporate sector in sustainability. So that was really big for a wee country down here. And uh, as typical with the UN, they don't give you much time. Uh, so we had, we had to be up there in three weeks and have a uh, presentation ready to go and our uh, sustainability director here went with me and um, and off we went and, and it was huge and they loved what we talked about and so then we started being invited to go to more things and to help them with, uh, with the developing policy so that was when I said to them hey look you know every time I come up here for three days it could be three days. I could be three days working and, and growing my market. Is there anything you can do to help me? Will I help you? So that was when they thought about it and said, well, would you like to put our logo in your clothes and, and to be able to use it? It was just huge. They'd never done that before and they'll never do it again. But that just gave us a massive cut through in the market. Even then, there was a fair amount of greenwash going on and quite confusing um, you know, certifications and something going on. So that was really, really great. Yeah. Would you say, I mean, what well, it's a challenge to balance sustainability and sometimes it means additional costs 
with um, building successful fashion business, but some of your trajectory seems to suggest that it's the fact that you had a mission that helped you to get out there. Would you say that your mission, your sustainability has been as has helped you to grow the business, has supported your marketing and the loyalty of your staff, of your loyalty of your customers? Uh, I think it definitely has. I I uh, I think it's probably finely balanced between sort of the the cost and the impediments that that the whole sustainability thing has um, we've had to deal with on the way through and the fact that um, it it has helped us get the brand out there. Uh, People have been really supportive and, you know, just like President Obama, that photo has been all around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, and people do love to wear that particular garment that he's wearing. Mm -hmm. You know, they say, I want the Obama one. So uh, it, it's definitely uh, been a, a balanced positive and negative because of the challenges of, as you were just alluding to then, just the costs involved in, in you know, doing everything properly and correctly. Tell us a bit about your product journey. So just going back to um, the originals and then where you are now, What? how have you... How have you developed the product? What what were the learning points, do you think? I mean, we've got in this room, we've got representatives from both established brands and new startups. What have you learned over the years around how you create a product that sells? I think it's just been, you know, it's been a lot of years. So <laughs> it's just using data as much as, uh, as possible. Uh, to just to check what is actually working over and above what you think is working and uh, and to just try and keep making collections that are uh, helping people live a full life in the, in the, in the most effort, effortless way possible. So our garments are for, for pay, for work, for, um, you know, for being at home. And for travel, you know, and I think you often make things that you know that you want. And for me, travel was such a long haul travel was such a huge part of my life that I knew that I wanted clothes that you could jump off the plane feeling good in and go and have a meeting in. I mean, there were times when I would fly down from Germany and stop over for a day in Tokyo and have some pretty high level meetings and then get back on the plane that night and fly down onto New Zealand. So the clothes had to be um, easy care, easy wear, but really stylish. Uh, and, And that's really built a following for us. Do you have a bestseller? A, a kind of product that's really worked for you that you've kept doing. Do you do you kind of keep a staple going on? We do. We've got a, a small number of garments that um, have been in the range pretty much forever. They get a little tweak sometimes, but but not often. So we've got a um, a fabric that we call mountain silk, which is our fabric, mm-hmm. which is a very fine merino which has been spun very fine and then twisted um, to two ends together. And it just performs so well. Mm. And so a lot of our um, garments have been around for a long time, have been made in, in this fabric, and there's no reason to, to change them, really. I've got one garment that I wore in the late 90s when we were testing this, and I wore it on, I think I had a six-week overseas trip, so I was flying in it, I was sleeping in it, um, I was working in it. And honestly, I can't tell the difference between that garment, it's just a turtleneck, black turtleneck, uh, between a later one that we made. The only reason I can tell the difference is because it's got a different label in it, because the label's changed since, since then. So... People come back for that. You know, they they buy a garment, they have such a good experience with it. So they're coming back for more. Mm. 
So really focusing on the product quality and the material quality, and you must have done lots of experimenting before you got it right. Oh, a, a huge, <laughs> huge amount. Another big, um, another huge uh, part of what we do is um, our, our possum blend. And I developed that blend back in the mid 90s, it was. And honestly, it was like doing a PhD in all things possum. These little <laughs> animals introduced from New Zealand, uh, from Australia into New Zealand. There's about 14 subspecies. They're protected in Australia. You can't get them anywhere else in the world. And But in New Zealand, they just loved our lush um, greenery. And so they just multiplied to the point where they became our biggest ecological threat. So the government was trying to eradicate them and they were leaving this fur on these possums lying on the forest floor. So we, so we thought it would be good to see what could be done with that. And it was a very long journey, but eventually we managed to convert, find a way really to convert the variation we get in a wild animal uh, to uh, a really high quality garment. These garments are amazing. Mm -hmm. they, um, the fur of the possum hasn't got any scales and, the, and it's hollow. Um, and the fur of wool, of fur, the fibre of wool and cashmere has got scales. It's the scales that make the garments pill, um, the scales lock up. But when we blend the possum fibre in, um, and throw it around in the washing machine. The possum fibre throws to the outside, creates a really light garment that um, doesn't help. It's amazing. <laughs> what about the ethical side of that? Oh, it's, that's a really uh, a, a really good question. Um, the possums decimate our native. Um, forests and flora, our endangered kiwi chick eggs, they, um, they eat. And so that's why the government has had to er eradicate it. For us, we're just using a recovered material. Um, you know, we're not out there um, eradicating possums. <laughs> so part of the solution in a way, and presumably that, so these are wild possums. Very wild. <laughs> yeah. Um, moving on to um, a question that we had through from one of the attendees, pricing. How have you managed the pricing? So it's always a difficult dilemma for any fashion business, but if you're trying to integrate sustainability and build that in, how do you get the pricing right? Oh, look, it's a challenge, and it's been a challenge all the way through. And I know some of your panelists, panelists, panelists were interested in, you know, the notion of local sourcing and how do we deal with the pricing. And you know, living in New Zealand and exporting as we do all around the world, we don't have the margins to play with that a company that's manufacturing plastic in the East does. You know, the, some of those margins are really quite large. So, um, but we find that our customers are so delighted with our product that they're happy to take a little bit less margin on the way through. And for us, it's a balance. You know, we don't ask our customers to pay more than we think that that garment is worth uh, when it's um, measured up against any other garment. So for us, it's absolutely essential that we do manage our sourcing and our development and, and our processes really well so that we're taking out as much cost as we can uh, on the way through without affecting the value of the garment to, to its new owner. Uh, but it's um, yeah, it's something we've just learned on the way through. So you presume you looked at similar products in the market and matched your pricing so that you can make it work? 
Um, Ye yes, I think you do. Uh, now, when you say a similar product, <laughs> you know, there's a huge range, isn't there? From a, you know, from a nine five dollar t shirt all the way up, and likewise with a sweater. But yeah, you just you just work it out as you go. But I think yeah. one of the things yeah. that um, sustainable companies need to need to do to make it work is to communicate what they're doing so that the customer understands mm -hmm. that value um, that you're building in. And so often nowadays, they're really, really willing to, um, to pay for that. So um, moving into marketing and sales, and a lot of, a lot of businesses growing businesses have the dilemma of wholesale or retail. I mean, I guess you didn't have that so much when you began because online retail wasn't really an option at that time. But how did you start selling and how did you take it to scale? Uh, so I started with wholesale. Uh, we didn't get into retail for 20 years. Uh, and I was actually a bit less than 20 years. It was about 18 years. And it was funny because I'd been selling two retailers for all that time and I I did think I knew everything about retail because you know I would help our retailers with issues that they had and, and had a lot of conversations about it but oh my goodness once we did open our own retail I realized that that's a, that's a whole other mm. um other thing to do well uh, but it was just a case of getting as much help as we could. We have a, um, a New Zealand trade and industry group. So initially they were supportive of what we were trying to do. And, um, and I would ask everyone, I remember being in um, North America early on and asking a, a buyer, what's the difference between a margin and a markup? So, you know, I'm talking pretty naive stuff here. <laughs> And uh, people have been really happy to, to, to help on the way through. Uh, going into online was an absolute no-brainer for us from down here. In fact, we were one of the very early ones to go online, I think, in the very early 2000s. And with that website, I think we got one order once from some strange country. And... Uh, <laughs> took the website down and came back to it a, a few years later. A little ahead of uh, your time. Yeah, a little ahead of the time. <laughs> but, but we do balance, with the wholesale, we do make sure that our retail works side by side with our wholesale so that, so that we're not undercutting the retailers that we sell to. Um, but it gets a little bit difficult uh, in the, for our retailers in the Northern Hemisphere when uh, they are competing, as it were, with our online. In actual fact, they can sell a garment for the same price that it will be for a customer that imports it directly from us, but it doesn't look like it is. Um, you know, by the time that customer's paid freight and duty, it all ends up pretty much the same, but that, that's something we have to work with. It's not easy from down here. Sure. And now, um, now how does it split? Do you sell mostly through the website or is it you, is your kind of network of wholesalers still as equally as important to you? Uh, it will be equally as important going forward. Um, a lot of our retailers have, have had a fairly big knock through, uh, mm -hmm. through COVID. And so they're, they're just starting to come back now. Um, as of the last few months. But, you know, we still intend to keep um, a strong wholesale channel going. Um, and But we are continuing to go retail as well and online. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the online presence looks fantastic. That must have grown quite a lot recently, I imagine. With the Yeah, we've just been through a, a big replatforming stage with that. And it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> so moving into sourcing and I think we touched on this at the beginning the the fabrics and the fibers are such a fundamental part of your success and 90 percent 96 percent of your collection is manufactured in New Zealand um 
how, how have you how, why have you chosen to do that and has that been why has that been the right decision for you in relation to both sustainability and creating a product that that meets the market it wasn't something that we intended to do actually it was to um, for it to all be made in New Zealand, but I couldn't find uh, manufacturers that had our social and environmental um, criteria boxes tickable. Uh, and if I could, I couldn't get ones that would do the quality. So we ended up kind of having to manufacture down here to meet those to meet those needs. We have now found. Um, a wonderful mill in Vietnam, which does all of those things. I think they're, they're the most, they've got the most sustainable building in the whole of Vietnam. It's amazing. Um, and everything else they do, we like, and they do great quality really well with us. And then we do work with a lovely group in India as well. And that really was actually, I'm from Christchurch, and that was a Christ, lovely Christchurch businessman came to me and said, look, I really want to help some women in India who have been really disadvantaged, and could we make your T-shirts? Uh, and so they've set up a way to train women to give them um, an opportunity for income, earning income, uh, beyond the options there like the sexual slavery and so on that's going on there and so they've been teaching these people how to sew and print and pack and end up through the accounting to staircase them into further careers so we just love that it's really fantastic how did you go about finding those those people because the partnership with the supplier is super important isn't it how, how did you build this? Uh, we, we asked everyone. We asked our spinners and, you know, anyone in, in the industry. And in the early days, I was working quite closely with IWS, International War Secretariat, based out in, in Delft. And I used to go and visit, visit them. So um, it's just a case of ask, 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 and ask again. Because often you're, um, if you, you know, if you go to Pitti Falati, for, for instance, they would know who the manufacturers or the, the, good, the good producers are and could often help um, with that. We just used to find that when it came down to tin tacks, they generally could do the environmental but not the social, or they could do right. the environmental and the social, but, but the quality actually wasn't there. Or they wanted far more, that, you know, the volumes were so much bigger than we can deal with. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't easy. <laughs> did you always go and visit them? I did. I, I, have, I yeah. have to say I've burnt a lot of um, air miles building this company. And, uh, yeah, we do I visit everyone. Any recommendations for others who are trying to build their supply chains, things that you learned that you would that you would kind of recommend doing or not doing about the way you build those partnerships? I think it's important that you do go and meet them face to face. And it's really important that you turn up unannounced at some mm -hmm. point if you can. And it's really important to have someone on the ground that can um, keep, an, keep an eye on things. I think that's, that's the main thing. Having said that, I have never visited our, the people in India but I um, work really closely with the Christchurch based part of that partnership. Uh, so. But when you were first building your production in New Zealand you I mean you had quite a few challenges didn't you as you grew the collection how did you overcome those to get the product quality you were looking for? <laughs> uh, oh look it was an absolute nightmare growing from you know me out of the medical world that didn't know anything about production and when we went from five you know we got to the 500 outworkers every second garment that came in from those outworkers was a second 
And it would be so much easier if I didn't have ridiculously high quality standards and didn't mind. So maybe your game. product wouldn't sell so well if you didn't though. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the that's yeah. the critical key to your success. <laughs> so so I asked around and I said, does anyone know of a of a kind of a computer that knits? I kind of figured that we could if we could have a robot. Oh, was this in the 80s? The 90s? Yeah. In the 80s. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I found someone who said that the, a Japanese company was um, making some computer-operated knitting machines. In fact, there was a German company as well. And uh, anyway, this lovely man from the Japanese company came and visited me and sold me on buying this machine, which I thought looked pretty cool. I thought we could knit the pieces and then my outworkers could still sew them together, but at least they'd be the right size and sh shape and so on and uh when he arrived to install the machine he said oh you need to get a, a um, an overlocker and I said no 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 I'm not going that, down that route but anyway we did end up having to get an overlocker and employ people I had no intention of employing people at that stage uh we now have a lot of people and it, it was really 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 tough we, um, that first machine that we ended up getting didn't have its engineering correct, it, did, the software wasn't working properly, okay. and uh, the ele electronics weren't great. Um, I don't know if any of you um, people on the call know about knitting machines, but the feeders didn't fit, so they would flick out and flick and, and um, break off the knockover bits, so then we'd have to disassemble the machine, bring in a whole lot of knockover bits, from Japan, put it back together again. It's just a nightmare. It was the worst part of the business, actually. The whole and all this time, you were recruiting more people to solve the problem, and so presumably you had to sell more. Uh, and, yeah, <laughs> we you know, we had that machine. I think was um, was over a hundred thousand, nineteen eighty dollars for Kiwi, um, which, yeah. And so it's about two Kiwi to a GBP or a USD. A lot of money. There was a lot of money. That was secured against our house. And I was paying 27% interest on that money. So, you know, we think inflation's <sighs> right now. Those were, those were really heady days. And we liked our house. We still live in our house. <laughs> that same house. And I didn't want to lose that house. So... You know, it was. It was so. Um, what saved you? Was it the success of those Fair Isle designs that kept you alive? Uh, actually, it was. I made. I had to make a key decision early on. The Japanese came back and said that the yarn you've sent us is too heavy for the machine you've ordered. Do you want to go finer yarn or heavier? Yeah, we'll go for the heavier machine. Which, by the way, we haven't built one yet. Yours will be the first. <laughs> Um, and uh, so I knew that the market at that stage was in the chunkier end, the market that we were accessing. So um, that was the right decision. And that getting that machine going was uh, gave us a real market edge for quite a long mm -hmm. time because it was a long yeah. time before um, anybody else was silly enough to, to get one. And so... I think, and I think it was just sheer determination and the fact that we didn't want to lose that house. Um, so it was all, every fiber of emotional, mental, financial energy that we had went into keeping us afloat at that stage. In a way, you had to take that risk in order to have the edge. So, so yes, look, uh, looking yeah. back on it, it did work out okay. Uh, and yeah, probably would do it again. Um, probably, yeah. And you were selling internationally at that point, so already trying to meet orders all over the world. I was, and so we got that machine in 1985, and we were already by then selling into USA and Australia. But very soon after that, we started selling much further afield. I was spending a long time offshore because once we got the machine and we had to bring staff in, 
um, on site rather than out work. We then needed to have year round work. And the season that we were working with was really short. It was the, it was the Northern Hemisphere winter. So we only had about four months and it was a winter product. So we actually had to work in both hemispheres, which required a lot of travel, which is quite hard. You know, you've got a small growing company and your CEO is off swanning around the world. I mean, the team must have been critical at that point. Oh, they, One of the hardest things to do as a, as a founder of fashion business is that balance between the commercial and the design. How, I mean, you, you, you seem to be, so you were heading up the commercial side. How did you, how did you get the, the other people around you to, to deliver on everything else? Uh, well, I've just had a really amazing people around me from the beginning, um, which I've been so lucky and, and all the way through. And yeah, I just looked for really good designers. We also at one point, uh, at one sort of part of our journey, we were working with designers in the countries that we were selling to. So we had a German designer on board, a Japanese designer on board. Oh, that was a great and, yeah. And then um, I went to Italy and um, I think it might have been through Pitti Filati, but um, I was introduced to Ornella Bignami, who designs, she's got her own studio in Milan with, with mm. the same knitting machines that we've got. So we got her to do a design brief for us because we actually had to design products, garments that felt right on the other side of the world. And New Zealand in those days tended to be the season behind. So we actually had to sort of be a season ahead. And so it was important to have that um, input coming from other parts of the world to help our designers. So the here. designers, were they based in country then? Um, no, oh, no, they, they were they were contracting it made me smile a German designer came to visit us once and I wasn't here and she wrote to me and said she was really it was lovely to come she was really sorry she only saw the sampling oh, so they were in they were in their own countries and yeah. You, yeah. yeah 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 I mean even yeah. more possible now but again quite ahead of your time to have an international team working remotely yeah yeah but perhaps that did give you an edge the ability to delegate the design in a way and have that local knowledge be a part of it? I think it did. I, I certainly think it did. And I think, but maybe it's less important now when you've got the internet and mm. everything's so visual and it's not so hard to know what's going on around the world. And I think design and fashion and sensibility is, is more similar. Um, there's a less country distinctiveness right. I think I might yeah. be wrong but in those days obviously without you know pretty pictures on your laptop um and if people weren't traveling and a lot of yeah um, people didn't travel yeah it was an essential so, yeah and do you think your philosophy was part of finding those good people who then stayed with you and were committed did they buy into your mission to operate in a way that 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 was good for planet and people? I think they did. I really do think they did. I think that when, I think that is one of the advantages of being on this journey is that uh, you do attract people who really want, they want to make a difference with their lives. Mm. And, um, and so in, in that case, they're keen to jump on board. Um, yeah. Going into the impact you've had, so quite early on, you you were committed to giving back. What led to the creation of your foundation and what does it do? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, even before that, uh, we, I think, strangely enough, we were one of the really early companies that decided to share our um our profits with our staff, all our staff, mm. every single staff member. Uh, and I think we somebody flew over from Sydney, from the Sydney Morning Herald to talk to me about why on earth are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but when we decided that we wanted to model a sustainable business, we uh, 
figured that there's, there's a lot that we can do through the company through, you know, we measure everything. We measure mm. water, energy, gas, waste, um, you know, the, the whole thing. And we look at the whole supply chain and, and out the other side. But we thought, then what else can we do? What can we do with the profits that we were hopeful that we'd make uh, beyond the reach of the business? And, and is this something that we could do that would kind of coalesce all the stakeholders of the business around and, and create a bit of a focus as to, as to um, what this whole um, company was about? And so that's why we set up the Untouched World Foundation, because we felt that, you know, you're in business to make a profit, and then what are we going to do with those profits that enhance things out in the big white world even more? So we, we, we looked into it for about two years before we set up the Untouched World Foundation. Initially, we thought that we would just contribute to someone else's project. And we sent out RFPs, request for proposals nationwide in New Zealand, asking people to write in and tell us why we should jump on and support them. But we looked them all and thought, thought they're just not deep enough. They're not um, comprehensive enough. And I'd been really lucky um, before I started this business. I, in the previous job I was in, I had a boss who kind of, brought out the leader that I didn't know was inside, actually. Um, and I thought, you know, how many people don't actually know that they're capable of leading? How many people don't even know about the issues that are facing the planet? So many people, even now. And so I said, why don't we put those two things together and create some leadership for sustainable future um, programs for um, young adults? Like we're talking. 17 to up to mm. 25, 26. And we had this, um, this wonderful um, man who I, has been for the whole 20 years of the foundation. He kind of co-founded it with me. Uh, and he's an old, um, Mark Prane, he's an old Greenpeace um, CEO and been involved in a lot of things. And he brought on a guy called Dr. Barry Law, who had set up in viral schools throughout New Zealand and had done a PhD in experiential learning. So we set up these experiential learning leadership programs, which are amazing. And we just get really good feedback from them and our staff just love them. So we integrate them with, with the team. So We've got a cafe on site now, but before we had the cafe on site, I'd get up early and cook everyone breakfast, you know, or hundred odd of them. Wow. And we bring in um, alumni from the from the foundation and ask them to talk to the our staff about what they were doing and how much of an impact these programs had made on them. And that really made a difference. So, you know, people in here who are linking or sewing together garments day after day, month after month, year after year, um, you know, they said that they can get a real sense when they come to work that they're contributing to something bigger. Brilliant. And what yeah. kinds of things has it changed for those young people? It's just two things. One is they've they've got these programs are really, really good. It's taught them to look at the whole sustainability, um, you know, the environmental issues and the social issues in the planet from a kind of a 360 holistic view. Um, and they're taught to sort of argue mm. from two different sides, you know, much like a debating type thing. Um, and, we, and we have some really good examples of that. One of them is one of our water-wise programs, which we originally actually set up with Bill Clinton. But um, it's, it's quite good because it is down south. So they might talk to farmers who want to use lots of water and lots of fertilizer to grow more crops. But then on, on the other hand, we might be talking to, you know, the people that are looking after the waterways and seeing that the waterways are 
are struggling with all of the nitrogen that's getting washed in, into the waterways. So, you know, it's all of those different ways of looking at things is really good. But, but the leadership is phenomenal. And I thought it was a fluke to start with, but, but it wasn't. But we found that, you know, we take people on these programs that nobody knows anyone else when they, when they go on. Mm. They get shown what to do for a couple of days and then they, they lead it themselves. So they form themselves into groups and teams and, um, and their energy goes through the roof. Uh, and the, and the, our people, the adults, step back and let them lead it. So they become little leaders that go out into their into the future and into their careers, whether it be medicine or law or whatever, um, and um, and they're making a difference on the way through. And we've got we keep in touch with those alumni, and some of what they're doing is, is just wonderful. So in a way, you're catalyzing change. You know, the the fact that you're able, you must be able to the more you're able to commit to that foundation, the more you can change. So the more you succeed with your products, is that the way you see it? That is the way we see it. And that's the only way we see it. You know, like we're, I'd be really surprised if anyone on the panel today has actually even heard of us before. You know, we need, um, we need those people out there. Um, we, it, it can't all just come from us. We need to infect other people. But can you imagine, you know, a business the size of yours, everything you've achieved, can you imagine what that might mean for the industry if some of the bigger players were to commit the same level of, um, you know, percentage of profits to this kind of initiative? It could be truly transformative, couldn't it? That would just make such a huge difference mm. for the planet globally. Um, I just so love them too because it's it's such a worthwhile thing to do and it's not hard, especially if they've got the, the grunts that they've got, you know, the size and the and the volume and and the capacity and being, you know, up in a higher populated denser population. Yeah. It, it really would shortcut away a better future. So you, you became a B Corp. How important do you think that is for you? What, why did you choose to go for that? And does it, does it help you both in relation to your impact and in relation to your growth as a company or commercial goals? Do you think it's relevant to that too? We went, we didn't do B Corp for ages um, because we just didn't think we needed to go down that path we were already you know pretty much um, ahead of where everyone else was at that stage and then we decided that it would be good to have a external certification so that not just us knew what was going on and it has been a really good process uh, it's one of the things that it's forced us to do, which we hadn't done. It's because we're a relatively small company and because we manufacture here and because I can walk through our workrooms any day so I don't need a piece of paper to say, you know, that they're not working overtime and they're getting their holidays and they're getting the sick pay and so on. Um, that one of the things that we didn't have was all of the um, policies you know, board level policies. And I thought, well, why do we need them? But actually, I think it is a good thing. And, you know, as, we, as we're as growing, that's something that, that um, is beneficial to have. So we're pleased about that. I'm going to move to a couple of questions that we've had in through through people in the, in the session. And just to those who are in the session now, if you have further questions, please post them in the chat. Um, now's the time to get some insight from Perry, but here's a good one. Um, how do you differentiate yourself as Untouched World in a market in which greenwashing is rife with companies like Primark and others um, promoting their what they, you know, their green credentials and their commitment to sustainability? 
Oh, yeah, it's a really difficult one. And the greenwashing is really quite, um, quite heartbreaking, actually, because it shows that the, that the population generally want to do the right thing. So they just know, need to know what the right thing is. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's communication. You know, we, we, we talk about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, but we're not mass market. And I think, uh, you know, going through the sustainable journey uh, is one of the reasons why we're not mass, mass market at this stage. But I think particularly the internet now and the website is a great opportunity to, um, to communicate in pictures what you're doing and why, and with data, you know, to talk about, um, you know, to graph your inputs and outputs and what's happening to, to your staff. You know, we survey our staff every year and the, in the high 90s, every year is the pride in the company they work for. Well, if someone's proud of the company they work for, they're going to really work, mm. you know, at capacity. Yeah, I mean, it is quite obvious from your website. It's worth having a look. Um, it's really nicely done, both the, the imagery and the messaging that you're getting across. Um, I suppose the challenge is how you get space in a in a very crowded you know, world in which other companies have thousands of millions of dollars to throw at marketing. Um, have, on that point, have you ever raised investment? And if not, how have you, how have you funded it? Your growth? Um, all the way through, we, we've, we've had to debt fund this business all the way through. I've had several attempts at um, getting investment in and you know, we're just not that, it's different now, but growing up through this, these earlier stages, we, we're just not that attractive. We're doing this thing <laughs> called sustainability. What's that about? Clothing Obama's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's run by a woman and it's out of New Zealand. And, and we did, we did go down the path of getting one organisation, one big organisation, it was the New Zealand one, and um, they had a whole lot of money that they'd been given to help uh, employment in, in a difficult area. And they came on board. I thought they were going to be great because they were giving their profits for help and education and so on. I thought it was a really good fit. And they wanted to put someone on the board. And the first thing this guy said was, can we just leave the sustainability stuff till later um, when we've grown the company and then we can come back? To so as soon as we could, we removed him and, his, and their money. Uh, and But now we have got people starting to write to us and, and say to us, look, if you need, ever need any investment, we'd love to jump on board. And I think they would now. Yeah. Um, but so you've proven, you've proven the model, but in a way it was an organic growth then, and probably yeah. the product was everything. So getting the product right so that you could deliver yeah. the sales. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I've, I've thought all the way through that it's, it's been, there's been a number of um, points where we've had some quite good innovation in our products, and that really helps because that gives you cut through mm -hmm. without having to... Um, you know, talk about, even talk about sustainability. So we've just got a few minutes left and it would be great if you could share your top recommendations for other brands in this space, starting out or more established when it comes to do, getting that balance right, growing the business and growing your impact. I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. I think it is about balance. And um, I mean, we're, we won't do anything that isn't right from a sustainability point of view, that we've just made that decision. But then it's a case of really doing your research into um, all of the aspects of the sustainability and digging down really, really deep and then keeping learning and studying because there's new information obviously coming through all the time. 
and um, it's so important that we keep abreast of that and make changes on the way through. You know, the, it's a good example of poly bags. You know, we use um, still use poly bags for storing our garments because it's really important that they don't get bugs or what have you in them. And it really broke our team's heart that we were continuing to use this plastic. And then mm. a lot of brands were, were moving to compostable bags. And a lot of our team members wanted to move to those. But we got a university graduate in to study the whole subject. And we discovered that compostable bags are actually worse, much worse for the environment because they break down into these tiny little fragments that you then can't do anything with. So it's just situations like that you've got to look into really carefully. And um, I think that's, that is really the key thing and um, getting a great team on board, making sure that you've got people who um, fit your values because if you have great experience and expertise but not a values fit, that can go wrong really, 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 um, really, really quickly. So I think that's, those are the keys. And so, I mean, there's so much data out there, isn't there? You could spend your time researching and almost get analysis paralysis trying to make decisions. But you talked about going with your gut at times. Has that been important to you? Uh, yes, it has. Uh, <laughs> I always say to people just, and it's been one of my mantras, is, is for us anyway, challenging the status quo, is do your research, but then just go with your gut. And, you know, there's so much misinformation out there that you just have to sometimes just use your head and, and see if it makes common sense to you. Because if it doesn't make common sense, you'll probably find that in 5, 10, 15, 15 or even 20 years' time, science will back up what your gut is telling you. And um, if you don't go with your gut, then how do you look at yourself in the mirror in 20 years' time? And science is now saying well, actually that was wrong yeah. well thank you so much we're coming to the end of our hour but it's been such a pleasure an honor to speak to you it's really one of the originals I mean what you've done is incredible um, and I think needs more presence and more profile I think a lot of the larger brands can learn a lot from the way you're operating the business um, just before we end, I wanted to mention to those of you in the room that we have some, some new features on Co. Um, if you're looking for sustainable suppliers, we have a, an amazing new tool called CoCreate. You can present your product, your projects, and suppliers will respond. So if you've got something tricky or trying to find, it's the ideal solution. Um, if you're doing events or you're looking to recruit to find that perfect team member, or you've got things to promote, the notice board is for you. It's, uh, we have now over 55,000 members on Co. So um, the notice board's getting quite a lot of traction um, and hopefully can help you build a fantastic team of people committed to best practice. And finally, co-training credits. So um, we see sustainability as something that you should, should become an opportunity rather than a cost. And our training credits build upon that. So whether you're an individual looking to enhance your career in the sector or a business looking to stand out, co-training credits can support you. So if anyone, if you complete a credit, you get a stamp on your business, on your individual profile and co. So all you have to do is um, get a series of emails, complete a short quiz, um, you can do it in a range of different topics. It skills you up. It shows that you're skilled on your profile. And then if you connect with a business, you'll also get that credit showing on your business profile and raising your ranking. So you'll get a higher search ranking and more views. Um, so welcome you to have a look at some of those. And I finally saved the date. Um, we're going to be running our second co-brand leaders summit on the 19th of October. The focus on secular fashion will be hearing from some of the foremost leaders in sustainable fashion who are taking forward best practice, who've tackled tricky challenges and come out the other end with both amazing products and incredible stories of impact. So welcome you. You'll see if you're on co, um, you'll get updates on that. If you're not on co, please do join. 
We are recording this session and the slides will be available. Uh, again, if you're on co, you'll get all of that through our mailing list. So thanks so much. Thank you again, Perry. I do hope that we'll be able to meet in Thank person <laughs> at some point. Um, but it's been wonderful to connect online. And thanks everyone for being part of the session. See you again soon. Thank you.